The Kraken Society has King Hecaton in their clutches, and the only clue to his whereabouts is a wooden coin given to the party by Princess Sarissa. The coin has the image of a golden goose, and it was found near the corpse of Queen Neri, Sarissa's mother. The characters begin this part of their mission by tracking the gambling chip to its owner, Lord Kashmir Dryland of Yartar. The coin is fairly unremarkable and easy to produce. It's half the size of a typical gold coin, and there's nothing magical about it. If you ran the optional module Kraken's Gamble, then the party may already have held a golden goose before, and if that is the case, you can skip ahead to Yartar and the Grand Dame. If you haven't run the mini adventure, it is not too late to include it, and if you wish, you can have the investigation to the coin lead to Artan Rosolio, the noble from the module's adventure hook. He is hospitalized in a nearby city and was found passed out near the Deseran River with a golden goose in his pocket. You can also use the optional hook sidebar from the module and have an organization reach out to the party when they catch wind of the party conducting an investigation. If you didn't run Kraken's Gamble and you don't plan to, you can just use the investigation rules from the book. However, I would make it so any party conducting the investigation in Yartar finds the source with relative and hopefully comical ease. I also recommend involving the Hands of Yartar, the all-female thieves guild that is based out of the city. Have an operative play a hand in the investigation or at least confront the party before they perform the heist, asking for a cut of the spoils for any jobs performed on their turf. Allow this member of the Hands of Yartar to accompany the party to the Grand Dame or simply monitor their activities while they are in the city if you prefer. This NPC can offer lore about the Grand Dame and even suggest that the Riverboat Casino seems to have more to it than meets the eye. Once the party figures out that the source of the coin is the luxurious boat casino of the Grand Dame, they should aim to acquire fine clothes and prepare for a night out. If you ran Kraken's Gamble already or are running it now for the first time, the party can borrow the fine clothes from Desia Rosolio. You can also have the Hands of Yartar or another organization help the party get the formal attire required, if you're sticking to the book. The party will need to leave all weapons and armor behind, including spellcasting focuses, to be able to board the Grand Dame. Pao Ming would screen all guests for magic items and components to ensure that all games are played fair. Fairly. Spells should be quite difficult to cast unless your spellcasters are able to find components somewhere on the boat. Whoever supplied your party with the fine clothes for the mission can also watch over their belongings while they are enjoying the evening on the river. A character may be able to sneak in a spellcasting focus or a small weapon depending on its size at your discretion. For those who have already run Kraken's Gamble, I suggest that you add the purple lady back into the mix. She can greet your party and be a friend or adversary depending on how you want to roleplay her. She may come to the rescue of the party if they find themselves in a confrontation with Pao Ming, or she could attempt to prevent the party from finding out the truth about the Kraken Society. She is a pretty flexible NPC, and her primary motivation in the adventure seems to be gaining power in the Kraken Society, so perhaps her eliminating Dryland and taking his position are now her new goal. She should continue to maintain the illusion that she is forced into her position for as long as possible, but seeing how the facade is beginning to break apart, this may be revealed before the end. Your goal as a DM of the Grand Dame Investigation should be to make an encounter with Pao Ming inevitable. A mage against an unarmored party is a formidable foe, and the party will have to get creative to take her down. Try to make her a threatening presence in the lead up to the gambling hall. Describe how she diligently looks over each party member using detect magic like some kind of fantasy bouncer. The party may have to craft a plan to steal her staff to trivialize any encounters with her or cause a disruption that demands her attention while members of the party sneak into Drylun's office. The party should have an interesting time navigating the casino, and if they enjoy being a patron, consider adding more games for them to play. Lord Dryland should be among the patrons with his pet octopus at the beginning of the evening, but he excuses himself to his office before the night breaks into full swing. If spoken to in the gambling hall, he makes polite pleasantries and excuses himself to his office if pressed too harshly. Ideally, he is confronted in the office alone. When confronted, be sure that Kashbir puts up a good struggle before inevitably surrendering. After he is killed by Slark Rithrell, Pao Ming should suddenly intervene and force an encounter with the party, attacking without explanation seeing her employer dead before her. Ideally, she flees before she is slain, using the staff of the python to create a distraction before jumping overboard. As the book suggests, she takes over the casino after Drylun's death. Finally, if you are incorporating Kraken's Gamble for the first time, you can proceed with the module as it suggests with one distinct difference. In this situation, it is imperative that Lord Drylun is absent from the casino, but rather than him being gone on an extended absence, he suddenly didn't show up to the casino that evening, and even Pao Ming doesn't know where he is, although she would never openly admit that. Kashmir Dryland is located in the room with Usith, the Abolith, located at the conclusion of Kraken's Gamble. When the party enters, he should run into the small room at the end of the chamber and hide inside. He can be confronted as written after the Abolith is dealt with. Additionally, if you are worried about the party being overleveled for this module, then feel free to make any of the encounters more difficult by simply adding more of the same enemies. 
For example, have some marrows crawl out of the water at the beginning of each round in the final confrontation. Another thing to point out is that the Avalith should be heavily obscured in the dark water and may be able to attack the party with its tentacles from cover until someone decides to leap into the water and confront the beast. This should allow Usith to avoid taking damage for the first round or so. The Avalith flees when it is clear it has been bested. In any case, a confrontation with Lord Dryland ultimately ends by his demise at the hands of Slarkwithrell, as the Kraken telepathically crushes his mind, but not before he is able to impart the necessary information to locate King Hecaton. With the information from Lord Dryland, the party can begin to trek the trackless sea to the Purple Rocks. They would need a vessel for the journey, and unless your party visited Svarborg earlier in the adventure, they have never had to procure transportation by sea. The book suggests that one of the factions offers a fully crewed vessel to the party for the expedition for the greater good of the realms, and at this point your party should be adventurers of great renown. They have certainly already made a difference by defeating one of the giant lords and liberating local realms from their torment. If no member of the party is in a faction, then the Harpers of the Lord's Alliance would still be willing to assist the party to do their part for the greater good of the realms. These crewed vessels are the ideal modes of transportation for the journey and destination as they provide the most interesting options for the encounters ahead. Your party should seek to locate Hecaton and then immediately use their Concha teleportation to head to Maelstrom with him, which will hopefully motivate them to take one of these more expendable vessels with a free crew to boot. The airship would be at great risk in this portion of the adventure, but it is ultimately up to your party what they do. If they seem intent on using the airship and do not seek out another method of transportation, have one of the factions reach out to the party directly. For the journey across the sea, you can choose to go as quickly or as methodically as you wish, forming bonds with the crew, sharing tales of fortune, and running into a few hazards along the way. I would plan at least three encounters for the party to have on the course of the journey. These encounters should always have a contingency to keep them interesting, as your party would be fresh for each fight. For combat-focused encounters, the lives of the crew would be the most impactful resource to focus on. The less crew the party has when they encounter the more Koth, the more difficult that battle will be. But consider adding weather hazards or role-playing encounters like sirens or other mythical forces that attempt to influence the ship and its inhabitants to make it a little bit more interesting. The encounter with the Morkoth should always occur during a storm, to set the ambience of the battle. Your party should have their vessel pull up parallel to the Morkoth and then roll initiative. The crew of the allied ship quickly deploy long boards to cross onto the enemy vessel, where the cultists fire mounted weapons and prepare to be boarded. The Marrows accompanying the Morkoth would attempt to pull in anyone crossing the boards, and if no one is crossing on their turn, they may ready their action and attack the next person who does. Raoul, the first mate and assassin, awaits for anyone foolish enough to board near him, and as the book suggests, he attempts to kill Tholtz, the archmage, if given the chance, which seems unlikely without some setup from the DM. When combat begins, the cultists will slowly make their way to the top of the ship to join the fray, including the mage Tholtz Daggerdark. If you wish, feel free to change some of his prepared spells out for some of the ones in his spellbook, or add a couple extra, like Delayed Blast Fireball, to make him a little more intimidating and make his time stop more devastating. Otherwise, Tholtz casts Fly on himself, peeking in and out of cover, blasting as many enemies as he can with his spells, and not paying much mind to his allies or the condition of his ship. During the extended combat, some members of the party may get access to the lower deck where Hecaton is magically bound. If Hecaton is released while the combat is progressing, he awakens in a rampage, as the book suggests. If the party deals with the crew before releasing him, then his rage can still happen from a role-playing standpoint, but I don't think rolling initiative is necessary. Once the two leaders of the Morkoth are defeated or incapacitated, the cultists begin to question their loyalty, but ultimately know that they cannot betray Slarkworth Rell and fight to the bitter end. Once the combat has ended and Hecaton is released, the party will probably want to take a look around, and you as the DM certainly want them to. Remind them that powerful individuals like this would likely have treasures nearby if necessary, using the members of the crew as voices for these thoughts. There are some nice treasures to add to the airship's hoard on the ship, but the most notable detail is the treasure of knowledge. Boltz has carved into his floorboards the words Dragon, Imrith, Sisters, and Treachery. If your party failed to oust Imrith last chapter, these clues should allow them to put the pieces together. Once the party has emerged from the hull of the ship with their new treasures, they should find Hecaton at the back of the ship, staring off into the endless sea. The storm would have settled down at this point, and the sun is set, leaving the light of the full moon illuminating the shifting waters below. Any attempt to rouse Hecaton from his stare is met with silence. Suddenly, off into the distance where Hecaton stares, a massive wave rises out of the water and begins rushing towards the two vessels at an incredible speed. Before the party can react, Slarkrithrell emerges from the darkness between the two ships, knocking the boarding boards into the sea. This combat should be a race to escape to the original vessel with King Hecaton. The Storm Giant himself can easily swim through the sea and board the other vessel, taking one or two party members with him if necessary. 
Sparker Thrill's goal is simple, to drag both of these vessels and anyone aboard them into the bottom of the trackless sea. He wraps his tentacles around the Morkoth and uses all actions on his turn to attack the ship until it reaches zero hit points. Ships have 300 hit points and Krakens deal double damage to objects and structures, so the ship will only last two or three rounds at best. The Kraken uses his legendary actions to attack anyone who tries to stop him, using his lightning storm and tentacle attacks. If anyone lands in the water, he attempts to use his ink cloud as soon as he is able. He would also cast control weather as he is initially approaching, which would cause the storm to return as the combat ensues. Once the Morkoth is destroyed, Slarkrithrell turns his tentacles to the second vessel in his waters. Unless, of course, the party was able to escape before he is finished with the Morkoth. If the Kraken takes half of his health during the combat, he gives up and retreats into the sea. His tentacles will be easy targets for martial classes as he wraps them around the vessels, and spellcasters should likewise be able to deal hefty damage. Sarkrithrell attempts to take Hecaton with him as he flees, as the book suggests, but allow the party an opportunity to save him before he is dragged down into the depths. If you like, you can have the Kraken destroy just the Morkoth and then flee, as the book suggests, but I think raising the stakes for stronger parties can make a very memorable encounter. Well, that is the video. I love how diverse this adventure is. The Grand Dame and the seafaring journey are very memorable parts of the quest. With Hecaton rescued and the Kraken Society in shambles, the party can finally return to Maelstrom victorious. It is time to hunt down Emrith, the Doom of the Desert.